exoplanets. And so, and it was going to be cryogenic and all that. And it was called TPF, Terrestrial Planet Finder Interferometer. They also had a Terrestrial Planet Finder Coronagraph. But I was also, we were also working on um, a program with uh, Air Force Research Lab there, their space vehicles. Okay, my comment about Washington is not being recorded, so now I can start recording. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, so uh, with AFRL uh, in Kirtland, in, in Albuquerque, they wanted to do a space-based radar with formation flying vehicles. And what both of them were sort of observing is that these were maneuvering systems of many satellites, and they were going to use propulsion, but propulsion was not only being used sort of pretty quickly, uh, propellant was being used, but also it was a contaminant to the system, especially for TPFI. So what I noticed was there was a, or what we noticed was there was a lot of relative motion that, that propulsion was being used to control. And, I, and we thought there ought to be another way to do, to control relative motion. And so we came up with um, electromagnetics to do that. And probably there's a lot of initial questions like, well, how far apart do they work? And, and how do you keep them cold? Well, I'll show you how you keep them cold, but I'll, I'll answer all those questions. <laughs> but uh, so that's what sort of germinated the idea. And uh, so the basic concept here, I'm going to walk around a little bit, is um, to provide actuation of relative degrees of freedom between satellites undergoing formation flight using electromagnetic forces and torques, uh, as well as reaction wheels. Um, and the um, because this is a force and torque that is generated internally, everyone knows conservation of momentum, linear and angular, so it's only controlling the relative degrees of freedom. So if you, but if you have a, like a 10 satellite array, each has six degrees of freedom per satellite, that's 60, six zero degrees of freedom. You can control 54 of those 60 degrees of freedom uh, propellantlessly. And I'll show you how that works. So you can do things like, uh, basically it's infinite ISP, uh, infinite Delta V, but as long as you don't go anywhere. So what missions don't go anywhere, but need a lot of Delta V, it might be station keeping for distributed satellites, you know, forming a, a, um, a sparse aperture array or doing assembly or doing what things that um, um, don't involve you getting going far. <laughs> so the idea is to replace consumables uh, and eliminate these thr thruster plumes, which especially for TPFI was a cont contaminant, not only visually, because you'd blind the telescope if you fired in front of it, and uh, and in cold optics, things tend to uh, to sort of freeze out on on optical surfaces, those surf those cold surfaces. And um, the uh, the nice thing about using reaction wheels and electromagnetics is they're both powered by electricity, which is a renewable source on you know through solar arrays. So this animation shows how the principle works. So you start out, since we're going to do formation flight here, we'll start with two satellites, um, perhaps launch them together, unfold the solar arrays, unfold the rings. It's actually full, fully controllable with three orthogonal reaction wheels and one coil. But in this case, we have three coils, and that allows you to decouple the rotation of the satellite from the rotation of the, of the movement of the dipole. So you power up one of the coils, it creates a dipole in the far field, north and south. You can steer that around using the coils. And, um, and then you can do that on both spacecraft and you can do sort of the obvious things. You can attract, you don't want to come that close. You can repel, but less obvious to me at the time was you can actually shear. And what it does is when you shear, you create these shearing forces, but you also create torques because you're putting angular momentum sort of in the clockwise direction, but through that motion. And so the vehicles had to rotate in the anti counterclockwise direction to uh, absorb that. But instead, you can absorb that in the, in the reaction wheels. And that's the decoupling effect. So what can you do with this? So I put them up here, my favorite telescope. And if you show this to the people at Goddard and JPL that worked on and others that worked on, on James Webb, you know, they sort of cringe when they see this slide, but I say it, this, this isn't something you should necessarily should do, but it's something you could do. There's a bunch of things you could do. You could, right there where it says I'm talking, right behind it, there's a, uh, there's a uh, secondary mirror for like a James Webb type telescope, which now you're electromagnetically trapping out in front of the primary. 
And that eliminates the secondary tower, its deployment, its optical obscuration, all those kind of effects. Actually, with, with um, you can trap the different segments together in the mirror to, to, make the, to make the hexagonal pattern. You can actually mechanically sever the telescope, secondary and the, and the primary, from the spacecraft, which the spacecraft's on the bottom there, and then it, the sun shield. Because what you can do is impart the forces and torques between the reaction wheels on the spacecraft to the telescope through electromagnetic um, effects. And so now, instead of taking the vibrations of the reaction wheels due to their spinning imbalances and having that ripple through to the telescope and away from air and line of sight jitter, you now can, you can only transfer the forces and torques you actually want to go into the telescope. And that gives you a very nice isolator. You could also uh, magnetically deploy and separate the sun shield. It's a multi-layer sun shield, and they're not parallel surfaces because you got to let the photons go out the edges. Um, and um, but then you'd say, well, how do I get power? You know, the solar rays on the bottom of the spacecraft there, and how do I power the instruments on the spacecraft on, on in the uh, telescope? And the way you do that is through inductive coupling. We do that every day with our. Well, I guess if you have a modern enough phone, it's that little disc you put on it. And I'm gonna show you some work we did in inductive coupling between these vehicles. So a good question is when you transfer electrical power from one vehicle to another, does that transfer mechanical momentum? I'll leave that as an exercise for the student because I don't know the answer. I think it does, I'm not sure which way. Um, so this is the first question I usually get. A lot of, can I move that little? Does that help? Yeah, actually, if you go up to the three little dots in the top bar, and you can both hide the video bar and the cast bar. So click that one, and that goes through the mat, and then click one more down below that, right there. There you go. And then, so I only know that because I accidentally did it. Should I click this X? Yeah. That's fine. All right, much better. So the, the question I get the most is, um, how far apart do they work? And what we did here, and I think I forget to men forgot to mention, is we, um, Alvar and I were leading a uh, capstone class where we take have juniors and seniors and they build something. And uh, this was one of the projects we built. And I'll show you the, the result of that. The, um, what we started off with was winding copper wire around, uh, around uh, iron bars and they made great heaters. They were, I touched one once, that was a big mistake. <laughs> Students love when the professor burns himself. But, uh, but then Ray Sedwick went, was late to class one day and he came running and I was wondering where the heck he was. And he comes running in with his big box and said, I just got a whole bunch of scrap superconductor from American Superconductor, which is out in, uh, out in the suburbs of Boston. And that made a, the, whole, the whole difference. And so if you put in high temperature superconductor, so I mean superconducting below at the time, it was below sort of 110 Kelvin and down. The colder you go, the more amperage, maximum amperage you can put through. But the force goes as those parameters where I sub T is the total current, so that's amp turns. Uh, mu naught is the magnetic permeability of free space, I guess. Uh, R is the radius of the coil, and D is the separation between these two identical vehicles. So the problem is it rolls off as diameter of the force power and the, the force does in the far field. And so that's why you don't, it's not great if you're trying to go someplace. But um, the uh, if you rewrite these equations to the one on lower here, the uh, it's a rewrite of the force. And what, what I've done here is I've grouped sort of in this first squared term, this ratio of terms squared. I'll actually go to the right, the right side of the equation. Um, there's the, there's the IC over rho. That's a technology term associated with the superconductor. And so it's the maximum amperage you can put through divided by the volumetric mass density of the material. And what we bought from American Superconductor is that number down on the right, 16,000 amp meters per kilogram. And then the second term, MCRC, that's sort of an engineering decision you make. How much mass are you willing to put into the coil and how much radius do you give the coil? And um, and so the way we were going to keep it cold was to bathe it in liquid nitrogen. Now, it's not a good trade to put in oil off liquid nitrogen in place of propellant, but we'll sh I'll show you another test bed where we did a cryo, where we did a thermal chamber that allowed it to be electrically driven. 
and uh, liquid nitrogen is around 77 Kelvin. And so that's the uh, that's the parameter we get at 16,000 for the um, capability of the technology. And this is sort of 2003 technology. Hopefully it's gotten better. So then back to the question of how far does it work? If you look at the upper right plot um, and you're willing to make a meter that's about two meters, a, a coil that's two meters diameter and about 30 kilograms of the coil, that's a product of MR of 30. And so if you look at the legend on the right side of the upper right plot, MR is the green line. And on this plot, on the vertical axis, you've got force generated and separation in meters. And so where that arrow is pointing to, that little circle on the green line says about 10 millinewtons, which is about electric propulsion thrust, uh, not high power electric propulsion, but normal electric propulsion at about 43 meters of separation between the two vehicles. Now you can put in more mass, you can make it colder, you could make the, the coil larger, uh, that, that can change all this. On the bottom left plot, we said, well, what if um, we had a threefold increase in that technology ratio, ratio of maximum current over density, and now you're at the 75 meters. And the other nice thing about it is, if you wanna move out further, you could take another one of these electromagnetic vehicles, put it in between, and the fields will couple, and then you could go out further. Where if you had propulsion, that doesn't happen. You're just going to be spraying at each other, the poor person in the center, or I guess all of them have a problem. But uh, uh, so they're like any um, you know, control in a potential field, be it a gravity potential field or electromagnetic, there's an escape velocity. You can figure out what that is. The bottom right there, the equation V sub I, if your initial velocity uh, exceeds that, which is uh, really one over the separation cubed. Um, then you'll never bring it back. You know, that's sort of the condition that if you go to maximum current, uh, they will stop their range rate at infinite distance. And um, so you always want to stay within that bound. And you can see that that velocity is smaller the further you initially, that initial separation. <laughs> so we said, this is cute on paper. Let's try to build one of these. So we built two of them. And we started with the class. And um, actually, two uh, Sam was University of Illinois. Layla was Uni yeah. University of Washington. Yeah, yeah, UW. So um, several UW grad students worked on this. Um, and so this is our test bed that we built in the class. We probably had about 20 students in the class. And this looks kind of mean, kind of dangerous too. But there are the two coils. You can see them in black there. And that's kind of a glue and a, I don't know if it had thermal thermal insulation properties, but let me, oh, it is running. But we had a liquid nitrogen reservoir at the top. That was that box and uh, and it was open. Mm -hmm. So, and you can see as it worked, we would float it on this, um, this uh, on an air bearing table here. And um, it, that's all the boil off of the liquid nitrogen. You can see the water condensing. You can also see we teach safety to our grad students and he's, He's uh, protecting his hairline. <laughs> I know the importance of that, but eyes are more important. But uh, here we're showing these are about almost 80 or 90 pound vehicles. And the one in the in the far, the far one is bolted down and has about 100 amps running through its coil. And uh, and then we would uh, turn on and off the, the current in the near one. But we're not doing control yet. And you can see they, they sort of jump out pretty quick. Now, these are really operating in the near field because you know, the separation is on par with the radius of the coil. But um, the, uh, but we, could, we were doing some control of the, uh, you know, it's sort of an unstable mode. And so we're, we're using a reaction wheel to, to try to you know, stabilize its rotation. And, um, and then this is the shearing mode, you know, when you're trying to cross. And what happens is, you end up commutating the current here between now it's in that edge coil, now it's in that edge, edge on coil, now it's in that edge end coil. And that's kind of like commutating a motor. Uh, but we're storing the angular momentum in the rotation of the vehicle. And that may not be great for a, for a real life system. So uh, the class ended. Uh, the grad students who were my TAs, that's sort of a model that we developed to bring the grad students in. We would be sort of um, creating test beds for use in our graduate research. 
And then the graduate students got a hold of it and they rebuilt it. We learned a lot from uh, building it wrong in a sense, and then we built it right. So now we put, we have the liquid nitrogen tank down low and it's completely closed, but it would uh, gravity feed up to uh, up through the coil. And then we had little two little smokestacks at the top. And um, can I ask you a favor? Sure. You move more towards the right so we can see. Oh, That's sorry. Oh, okay. So this is a little bit about uh, how we built it. You can see we built these uh, sort of copper channels. Uh, and in, on the upper right photo, we uh, you can see about 100 turns of high temperature superconductor that we put in there. And, um, and then you can see the leads coming out of the copper channels. We had all our power electronics that were on the warm side. And that's part of what some of the losses were. But we were using like four D cell batteries for about 40 minutes mm -hmm. uh, at pumping 100 or 100 amps, yeah. which uh, sort of amazed me. It's, it's funny, when we first put it on a power amplifier, the breaker kept popping because the power amplifier is detecting a short. So duct tape helps there too. <laughs> now we, we had someone that, that uh, we, we had a, another staff member who was really good at power electronics came in and, and set us up properly. But, um, and then that copper channel is what would hold the liquid nitrogen. So we built a uh, power amp system for this, a power uh, a, um, amplifier system for this. We're using a using an H bridge. This was out on the warm side, and um, and what we do is once you get the right amount of current going through it, we then flip some switches, those little yellow switches, and we let it freewheel. And then we had little um, current detectors, and if it deviated by maybe ten percent of the current that we were commanding, then it would it would close the circuit again and goose it. And whenever we wanted to take the current out of that coil, we pumped it back into the batteries. So then we, um, with this test bed, we uh, put closed loop control. So here again, the one in the background is bolted down. Uh, the one in the foreground is uh, floating and is trying to hold its position where that little black tape is. So he nudges it forward and uh, it puts current into that face on coil, comes back, and then it has to reverse the current now to stop its, its separation rate. I tell my students always have the camera running because you don't know when what takes are actually going to work well and what's going to be your last take. <laughs> so editing room floor is very helpful. So here's the shear mode. And now we, um, we're we using the reaction wheels much more effectively. And it shouldn't have had this sort of wobble like that, but you know that's, that's a tweaking of gains on the control loop. But it comes back. They're very happy. That's like tape number 50 or something. <laughs> and uh, these are very powerful. Uh, torque controllers. The uh, that's not the reaction wheel doing it. You know that's that's the electromagnetics. They're they're on par with reaction wheels in terms of the torque they can generate. And that's the separation. He did not exceed escape velocity. That's a good thing, or at least on this try. And it comes back. So we started to look at different kind of. Uh, mission analyses, you know, retrofits on missions and how this would help. So this, this is uh, TPFI, Terrestrial Planet Finder Interferometer, and I saw some people nodding their heads that sort of remember those days. <clears throat> so it was five spacecraft, and the total baseline between the left end and the right end is S. And so that S over three, S over six is the relative spacing that's sort of dictated by a Bracewell interferometer, and I won't go into that. But um, we looked at, if you look at the bottom left plot, that's mission lifetime in years. And um, on the vertical axis is the total mass of the system. And so the bottom black line is the dry mass. So without any propellant and the power and systems that run it. Um, then the curves are different kinds of um, propulsion systems. And so you can see a very steep curve, the green line, and that's cold gas. And basically that's just not, doesn't have enough uh, ISP to, to do the mission over the required time. I think this was a 10 year consumables mission. So uh, then you can look at some other things. We've got colloids, PPTs, uh, 
field effect emission propulsion. And you can see, and those are growing with time because they're consuming propellant, but then you can see uh, a room temperature electromagnetic coil, that black line at the top, the dash line, that's prohibitive. But then you can see the red line is the electromagnetic superconductor. And um, you know it, it trades in very favorably. We also looked at trying to make some um, sort of non-Keplerian configuration. So this is one where we want to hold the, uh, the vehicles separate in the cross-track direction. So it makes these, it causes these vehicles not to be orbiting the center of the Earth. And so you're constantly doing a plane change on this. And the way we, so with propellant, that would be pretty prohibitive. But the electromagnetics, you can do it. The magenta arrows are showing the direction of North Pole and the magnetic field. The blue arrows that keep pumping out are the angular momentum that's stored in the wheel, and um, and that needs to drain. So what we do is, since you can repel with north facing each other, you can also repel with south facing each other. Um, that's the way to to keep this uh, from exceeding its capacity of angular momentum. And so there are different configurations you can make that are interesting. I'm going to skip that one. So I, I asked my grad students, so we, we, we built test beds with two vehicles. We, we uh, show examples with two vehicles. I want to see more than two vehicles. I want to see three. So one of my grad students came back with 10. And this is an interesting one. It's, um, so this is flat, flat space, no gravitational potential well. It's uh, 10 vehicles. They're starting at the red axis. And have to have to find have to go to the green. Now starting at the green axis, have to go to the red axis, and it's not a minimum fuel problem because there's no fuel. It's a minimum time problem. But in a flat space, you think minimum time is a straight line. But in this case, it's not because they have to. It's like billiards; they've got to bounce off magnetically, bounce off the other vehicles to get there. And so we looked at different ways to optimize this profile. It's a non-unique solution. So we put in another parameter. These vertical arrows show the amount of angular momentum that's stored in the vehicle. So what we did was we penalized the worst case angular momentum being stored in any, any vehicle to, because you're probably going to have to size your reaction wheels or whatever that worst case is. And so by minimizing that, you can use smaller, lighter reaction wheels. The other thing you should know and probably know that is that you can see the, uh, the frame axes at the in the center there, the center of mass never departs that point because it can't, because it's conservation of linear and angular momentum. The other thing is here, this was an all up optimization, but you could think of doing this in different ways. It's kind of like communication systems. You could do CDM, C, CDMA, FDMA, there are other kinds of, so you could do something like that. Catching on the news. You could do a, um, you know, a frequency division modulation, for example. You could operate some of them. You could take the, um, the, the current and oscillate it at one frequency, and the ones that it wants to interact are at the same frequency, but others are at a different frequency, so they will orthogonalize over time. You could also do time division, turn some off, move a subset of the array, turn some others off, move them. Uh, there is kind of a, a local strength or an influence function that the ones that are near each other are gonna have a lot more effect on each other than the ones far away. And they're, I don't know what code division would do, but I guess it's some orthogonal code like a, like what GPS does. That, <laughs> but um, so there's some other interesting things that we never really looked into about how to, uh, how to do that. So thermal control, you know, uh, a, cry, a boil off cryogen is not a good replacement for a, um, for propellant. So what we built is a um, toroidal vacuum chamber. And you can see the edges, it's sort of got those gray edges. And, and there's another half of that, sort of like a bagel that's been sliced that goes over top of that. So then we can evacuate it. The copper pipe is what contains superconductor. And, um, and this chamber is about um, two or three meters, two meters across, I think. So just a little bit about it. Instead of putting what it's a, what we did was we created a um, a cryogenic heat pipe, so a passive one without any any 
pumping or it's natural pumping. So instead of, so what you do is you place a cold finger like a cryo cooler at one point, we just used a little li liquid nitrogen reservoir, you can see it there. And then we used in the upper right figure, there's screening inside. You want two different size meshes on the screening. And what happens is you put nitrogen into this big copper pipe, and then you, um, at the cold finger, it will, it will liquefy. It'll then stick to the, the, uh, to the screen, to the mesh, and then it'll capillarily wick through the system until it picks up enough heat that it then goes gaseous, it comes back. And so this just shows it working. Um, so in that bottom right plot, the vertical axis is temperature in Kelvin and the horizontal axis is minutes. And what you see is the, the dark horizontal black line. That's the critical temperature. That's the 110 degrees Kelvin at which it'll, below which it'll start um, superconducting. And, um, and you can see that the time history here, all the points go down to, it's about 83 Kelvin or something like that, 85 Kelvin, which is more than enough. We, we actually put an internal source in there and heat, heated it up there at the 140 minute point. But um, there really is no internal source of heat. So it, I don't know why we did that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can keep this cool electrically. And actually what we found out is you want to do this as a um, sort of a nested layered heat pipe because cryo coolers are more efficient at removing thermal watts the higher the temperature those watts are. So if you can remove most, if, because all the sources of heat are on the outside. So if you had an outer one that maybe pulls out heat at, um, you know, at 200 Kelvin or something that would really put less of a burden on the internal, internal thing. So you could do nested coils here. We never went too far with that. We did some analysis on a two, two layer one, but uh, so then we, um, we wanted to build a smaller one and we also wanted to see if we, this would work up on the International Space Station. So this is what we call micro EMFF. It's non-cryogenic because we knew when we get the space station, we shouldn't have liquid nitrogen floating around in a zero gravity environment. That would get you above the fold on the, <laughs> in any magazine, I guess. So uh, what we did was we started with DARPA and they funded us and we built something we call micro EMFF. And in this case, it's room temperature. So we, we created a LC circuit and, or an LRC circuit, so it resonates. And the, the coil is the inductor. And we had, uh, I think, supercapacitors of some type in that coil. And uh, I think it was 90 hertz. Here it's on, a, on an air-bearing swing arm. And the vehicles in the center are the ones that we had, that we had on Space Station that Professor Sanzotero built um, in his class today. We're going to show one of those. But um, here, what we do is we, since they're resonating, they're both resonating at 90 hertz, the, um, we would change the phase from in phase to out of phase, and that's how you get attraction and repulsion. We then built that system and put it up on space station. And here you can see two of them. One, this is in the Japanese module. That's the gem airlock that goes out to the back porch. The uh, the one on the left is on suspenders. You're sort of seeing the uh, the coil there on the edge. And so we position the right-hand one using thrusters, and then we do electromagnetic attraction, and then it goes to electromagnetic repulsion. And um, that one was without, contr without control. Um, so it was just sort of direct attraction and repulsion. We also did um, wireless power transfer. And so this is just sort of a prototype we built on the ground. This is actually the University of Maryland. And um, and they were the PI for this uh, for this particular experiment on station, and we were the we were the subcontractors since we had the uh, the Sphere satellites, which had all the processing and thrusters and sensing on board. <clears throat> and basically, uh, you can see up there, it's sort of a analog to what we did on station, where you have one coil that's the leftmost that's <clears throat> attached to some power power supply. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we're oscillating the current and then that inductively couples with the one on the right, which lights the light bulb. And uh, I think we were getting upwards of 35% efficiency in the transfer of power between the two. Uh, so summary, I'm not sure what time it is, but, oh, is that clock right? Okay, that's rare, good. <laughs> um, 
So let's look at assembling a telescope. First thing you do is you get a flight and you write your name on the side of the rocket. It's always a good thing to do. But if you took the mirrors, like in that early fig figure I showed you, maybe not like James Webb where it unfolds, but actually stack them up like dishes in a kitchen cabinet, then one vehicle, one electromagnetic vehicle might come out of the bottom and it's pushing and torquing against one that's on the top. So come in, grab a mirror segment, connect it up top. Unfortunately, our animator, we forgot to tell him, any truss should always have a diagonal and he's missing a lot of diagonals here for strength. And uh, these are flat mirrors, which have infinite focal length and that's a problem as well. So, but, uh, so, you know, you can imagine coming up here and having a work site where you're trying to build a mirror out of our Sun L2 that's, you know, maybe eight, 20, 30 meters in diameter. And, um, and then the last thing you pick up is the secondary mirror. And you jettison that and hope it doesn't come back. And, uh, and then you put the secondary mirror in place, tuck those solar arrays out of the way, but still in a way that you can generate power. And, and then um, you've got that telescope I showed you on the, on the second slide. One direction. So we got close to doing this. Um, we're trying to assemble, robotically assemble a telescope inside the uh, International Space Station. And we had the mobility vehicles, which are the, in this case, blue. Those are our spheres that were already up there. We'd already built docking ports, which are those sort of down, if you along that sort of primary tower there, there's the, um, there's those sort of silver identical pieces that are against each other. Those were what we call universal docking ports. We had those up on station. We had the central hub, which we called the halo. We had that up on station. And uh, we didn't have the mirrors yet, but, uh, and someone could say, well, you know, what good is a telescope when it's inside a, a metal can? But if you want to go test out your technology and see if you can robotic, you can autonomously assemble it, there's nothing like having guardrails when you're doing that, because I like to think of it as analogous to a wind tunnel. Wind tunnels are where you take a formative technology, you test it under nominal conditions, as well as off nominal conditions, because you want to see what the technology breaks, because that informs where you make future investments without harm to the, oh, you're testing in an authentic environment, wind tunnels, wind, here it's a microgravity, long duration microgravity. And you do it in a way that there's no harm to the test bed, the operator or the facility. And so if you want to really develop autonomous spacecraft assembly, you know, it's a great place to do it. But there's just not much to look at. So <laughs> um, that's all I got. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, we have a... We have a few questions online, so if I can start out with one of those. Only the easy ones. <laughs> Alvar, I think, yeah, our points. <laughs> um, Brian Hanley asks, could this be used in the Van Allen belts to create thrust against the charged particles? Well, my first answer is I don't know. Interesting question. Uh, I am a former professor. Well, I'm not, I still have grad students. I'm a professor post-tenure. I don't know if you have that here. No, we have like affiliate faculty. Kind of affiliate. Oh, I, I still have my chair. I still have my chair. Still have my title. I still have grad students. I can so still. still a faculty member. Yeah, but I'm. I don't have tenure, so I'm responsible oh, for generating yeah, my own salary. Yeah. yeah. So whenever whenever anyone starts answering a question that wasn't asked, that means they don't know the answer to the original question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, there's yeah, charged particles, Lorentz force, something like that. There's a cross product in there someplace. That's an interesting thought. It, the thing is you can't really use this to, to push against Earth's magnetic field because force is really, the amount of force you get is the strength of the dipole, function of the strength of the dipole and the curvature of the field lines through the second vehicle. And Earth's magnetic field is pretty strong, strong dipole, but the lines are, are straight, are parallel through something that's small. That's why you really need long tethers for that. But, 
again, I'm answering a question that wasn't asked. So great question. <laughs> Uh, can it do detect and decollision? And if it does decollision, how long ahead of time do you need to know before you change its cycle? So a collision with another electromagnetic vehicle might be one collision you're talking about? That or, or particles in space? Oh, like debris coming in? or Yeah. Um, another good question. <laughs> uh, you know, I always think in terms of time constants. So if it's a cryogenic system, it doesn't like to change it with, you know, it doesn't want to change its current very fast. So there's some kind of latency, some kind of amount of time you need to have knowledge that you're going to have a collision before it can sort of respond to it. Um, the only way it can move is if it moves against a partner vehicle, you know, another one that's an electromagnetic vehicle. And, um, uh, you know, they could sort of shove each other out of the way. If some part particle was coming through, um, you want to make sure that when you do that, you don't you remember to pull back together. Otherwise, you'll exceed that escape velocity term. Um, there are some there are some interesting things about um, high energy particles cutting holes through the superconductor. So now the amount of superconductor and path goes gets smaller, and I guess there's a there's an effect that we never saw, but people kept warning me about it is if it trips out of superconducting mode. Um, there's sort of a lot of energy that can suddenly be released. Never saw it, <laughs> but uh, I guess hope is not a good plan. But, uh, um, you know, so there's that that effect of it starting to, starting to sever the path. Now, the, the chance, I guess, of having a bunch of, um, you know, high high energy particles sever right across in a single cross section is pretty small. Um, you know, it's probably going to hit it several points along the conductor. Of course, the way we had them stacked in layers, you know, it's, we never really looked at that. In other words, that's why I'm not probably giving you a satisfactory answer, but it's, uh, yeah, you can use it to maneuver. You need some, some advanced notice of it happening, of like a space debris coming by or something like that. And, uh, we never really looked at the, uh, the radiation impact on the effect on the ability of the uh, the conductor to operate. Well, say that there would you need lens? No, I I, I think you. Well, the answer is always it depends how much yes. strength do you have and all that thing. But you know, we were we were changing the current on the in the coils on the order of um, several seconds. Okay. So, um, you know, probably a minute would be good to know it's there. A minute, you know, collision collision avoidance, I think is not really about how far away it is, it's how close it is in time. Because it could be close and moving very slow or far and moving very fast. And, and so minutes, minutes of notice probably, which probably should be reasonable. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we have um, two related questions from online from uh, Yoon Jung Lee. Uh, one, how did you cool HTS at the Spears facility on the ISS? Oh. And how do you plan to cool HTS in space while assembling the mirrors? So on, on ISS, we did not cool it. That was a room temperature test bed. And uh, so we had a lot less authority, you know, sort of forces we could generate. Of course, in ISS, you can't get far, inside ISS, you can't get far away. Um, what we did have is we had some boxer fans on board and uh and there you got to worry about you got to reactuate them because if you just have one boxer fan and it's blowing your test bed's going that way <laughs> you know it's propulsion mm -hmm. and uh so we had to make sure that they were they were counterposed and all that but um and then um you know if if you're out if you're outside the vacuum of space and using the cryogenic superconductor you would have to cool down the vehicles before you start operating them if you needed something with that authority um, the, uh, that would take, I mean, our, 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 um, cryogenic, our, our cryogenic heat pipe, uh, showed us that that could be on the order of minutes. Um, but, um, but that's what we would do. We'd use the, uh, the heat pipe method that I showed. Also, if anyone has questions about general space telescopes, then the Astro 2020 Decadal that came out last year, 
Um, I'd be happy to try to answer some of that, James Webb. Oh, more hands are going up. <laughs> I think yours popped up first. If you have an array of, let's say, 10 satellites and you have your 60, 60 degrees of freedom, you mentioned four of them need propellant, three being, I'm assuming, the center of mass of the system. What's the fourth one? Uh, oh, no, you, um, six. There's okay. six degrees of freedom you cannot control. And okay. it's the three translations of the center of mass mm -hmm. and the three rotations about the center of mass. Sorry, I might have no. misspoke there. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, you, it seems like you need two of these vehicles to couple each other, but if you have one and then another vehicle with just passive conducting coils, could you induce a current in the passive vehicle that just like attracts like a magnet attracting passive iron? You can induce that um, current in the second vehicle and that you could use for, you know, transferring electrical power. Um, could you push that a second the passive vehicle around? I think is what your question is. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good thing to think about. When, when, but I'll tell you something we did think about. <laughs> I learned this when I was in Washington. You answer the, it's called the pivot. You answer the question you, you want to answer, not the one that you've been asked. <laughs> but uh, the, um, you know, if you were doing an inspection, then let's say space station needed an inspector satellite that was going around it, or maybe the gateway out at Earth. Moon L2, um, you know, that that inspector doesn't necessarily need its own power source. It does, may not even need its, it doesn't need propellant. It could be because you can, you can wirelessly transfer power to it. It can use that to energize its coil and you can, maneuver the, and then the coil that's sort of wrapped around space station could then that's a fictitious coil. There isn't one that's wrapped around space station right now, but you could move that. It really sort of lightweights the other vehicle and that inspector satellite. And actually, I'll show you back to the slide I skipped. Um, you can, this was sort of an inspector scenario where what I was trying to do was get vehicle A and vehicle B. Vehicle B, sort of the mothership, vehicle A is, is the inspector. And I want to get that angular rate omega to maximize given a fixed mass. And what you find is you get the maximum angular rate when you give the two vehicles non-equal mass. And there's an actually a mass ratio that's uh, not one that uh, gives you the fastest sort of motion at a given radius or given diameter, I guess. But uh, so there's some interesting ways to design um, like inspector satellites that way. And maybe this idea of pushing against uh, a passive object might work as well. We didn't look at that. I'm uh, surprised that your uh, uh, loop heat pipe, no, uh, your heat pipes, uh, uh, steady state, uh, vision steady state takes minutes. It should be more efficient than that. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if you have some kind of outgassing going on in your inside your heat pipe or some maybe you didn't pull adequate vacuum on it before you introduced the working fluid. Yeah, it's um. The circumference of the pipe was about six meters. So, and it probably also depends on the flow we had from the liquid nitrogen loop on it. It's probably a couple parameters on there that, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, there is another okay. technology called blue P pipes and then more, even more. Oh, okay. Than, right. uh, P pipes. Yeah, well, that's good. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, all our motivation for doing that work was basically, they said, I, I was getting the question, do you really think that a boil off cryogen is better than, than yeah. uh, electric propulsion? So I finally had to try to answer that question. And <laughs> so we did that. But, but you know, if your objective yeah. is to um, improve your you know, response time. Yeah. Yeah. And also that ended up in our, in our analysis, that ended up being a somewhat heavier piece of it. And so that's going to help a lot with better technology there. Yeah. And blue heat pipes are also lighter than heat pipes. Good. Thanks. I haven't delayed the faculty meeting. <laughs> That's a good thing. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you, David. That was, that was great, great uh, overview. So quick question for imaging applications. Has, what is the bottleneck of using this for, you know, I, I remember like arc minutes, attitude control or centimeter or where are we in terms of being able to use this for imaging Yeah. Um, so the way I think about um, 
precision control is along three dimensions. One is sort of the, the um, dynamic range of the system, sort of how, what's the ratio of the largest stroke of the actuator and the finest sort of impulse bit, if you want to think of it that way. Another one, another dimension, and, and the thing is, you know, we're, we're probably not going to be able to do uh, 50 nanometers kind of control with that, but but with all telescopes, it's a staged actuation system. You know, you've got mm -hmm. interferometers, you've got multi-stage delay lines, you've got fat, you've got fast steering mirrors, you've got um, you know, you've got segment actuators behind James Webb, you've got uh, deformable mirrors and things like that. So yeah, I think like of, for PPT where like at the spacecraft level, it was a centimeter, maybe, right? Yeah, I mean okay. some, and then and then the other dimension, so there's there's the bandwidth of the disturbance relative to the bandwidth of your actuation. So that ratio, so it's dynamic range, bandwidth ratio. And so if you have high frequency disturbances, you know, this L, this LRC, mm -hmm. or I guess with the electro, with the um, high temperature superconductor is more just an LC circuit. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too low pass for, uh, for high frequency stuff. So you need other actuators to do that. The third dimension is, um, is, sensor is sensor resolution mm -hmm. and so you can't control what you can't measure so but you know laser metrology is something you could use and the nice thing about that is it, it has high dynamic range mm -hmm. you don't need to have a whole bunch of stages of it so it's um <clears throat> this would have to be one part of a multi-stage system mm -hmm. actuation system yeah like that secondary mirror it's out there you know, you gotta, you have to, it's gotta be some kind of adaptive mirror. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Um, let's see. We have one, is uh, EMFF viable or attractive in space considering all the extra weight and volume, including cooling? Um, I think so. It depends, is the answer again. Uh, there's a, there's an interesting chart that that uh, creating non-Keplerian orbits, you know, if you move them in the cross-track direction as a function of, alti of orbital altitude, there are regions where EMFF is better than propellant and regions where it's not. I don't have that chart, but, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, things like, like this slide, you know, for TPF, it had a two-hour rotation rate. It had a 75-meter baseline. Um, our red... EMFF superconducting line there is is as holistic as budget keeping as as we could make it at the time, and it still was pretty feasible for that kind of mission. Uh, but it's it's one of these things, you know. It's I've heard the rule that the um, <clears throat> the ISP of the propulsion system should be on par. Well, the exit velocity of the propulsion system should be on par with the delta v you're going to ask from it. I've never found that optimization, but it's uh, I've heard that as a rule of thumb. So if you're if you're gonna use a very high ISP system like FEEPS, uh, you shouldn't use it for a low delta V mission because the weight of the power system that you have to use to drive it, you're lugging that around. And so, you know, you'd probably want it for high delta very well. If it's infinite ISP, you want it <laughs> for very high delta V missions. Um, I have one more very specific question. Okay. For 300 kilogram satellites, how much is the weight for HTS related components to achieve 45 meters distance? <laughs> I'm pulling off on that one because that felt very similar. Well, no, me, I, I might be close to that. Let me see. There's a whiteboard in the back. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, <clears throat> so for 43 meter distance here, um the uh the, the mass of the coil this is a single coil that's two meters across that's 30 kilograms um the power system i'm not sure what that mass was they were probably asking for the whole and then the, and the uh what's the mass of the um the cooling system yeah so that's not on this slide but um it is in the thesis of uh PhD thesis of Daniel Kwan, K-W-O-N, that you can get on DSpace MIT. Mm -hmm. And um, 
because he designed the uh, the um, the the uh, cryo the um, cryogenic heat pipe. Yeah. All right. It's a free download to anybody. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know the answer, know where to be able to help them find it. Yeah. That's all we have on that. Okay. Any okay. other questions in the room? Thanks for your time, and I, I really you. appreciate it. Thanks for having me, and thanks to uh, Professor Sanzotero for making this all possible. He's all these different. We we ran like, I mean, we you ran all the space station experiments for me, and we had like six or seven up there. Um, and uh, and if you don't know what zero robotics is, you ought to talk to Alvar about that. It was a fantastic. It's the only it's the only STEM robotics competition ever run off the planet. And there's a nice movie about it too. So he's the creator of it. So we're very happy to have him. Great. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you all. You.